Let's talk about shields used alongside cutting pole arms. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So on my um, Patreon channel, so I put unique videos up on Patreon, and one of my Patreon supporters there, Matthew, spelt the French way, Matthew, I believe, uh, sorry for my pronunciation, asked me an excellent question, which funnily enough, I have actually thought about uh, addressing in the past. I think probably some other people have asked me the question as well, and I've thought about it myself. Um, and the question, quite simply, Matthew's question is, can you use cutting pole arms? So pole arms that are able to both thrust and cut, or indeed some pole arms that are only able to cut, can you use them with a shield? Well, I'm going to give an answer, unlike me, unlike what I normally do, I'm going to give an answer right at the beginning of the video. And unfortunately, it's not going to be a very um, satisfying answer in, in that uh, the answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends very, very much on the type of pole arm. But generally speaking, the answer is no. Now, let me qualify that point. So generally speaking, the answer is no, but it depends a little bit on the type of pole arm. So what I'm holding here is commonly known as a winged spear. Um, it's a type of spear that you find commonly in the 8th, 9th, 10th, through to the 11th centuries actually and then there's a there's a later a sort of later medieval version of it as well you actually find something quite similar in fiore's um treaties uh, that he calls the giavarina which i think the closest translation we have to that in english would be a spontoon um, and a spontoon is a spear with a cross piece on it yes indeed it is a bit like a boar spear i would just say some people call these boar spears this is not really a boar spear. So as it happens, I'll just stick this out of the way. As it happens, I was actually looking at some original antique boar spears um, a few days ago. When was it? Uh, anyway, it was a few days ago. I think it was last Monday. There we go. Last Monday, I was looking at some boar spears in Warwick Castle. And uh, in actual fact, that will feature in a video that's coming up uh, that I filmed with Matt Gallus, um, who some of you watching this will have heard of, or in fact know personally. Um, but um, I was in Warwick Castle with Matt Gallus and Scott Brown, and we filmed filmed a little bit, a uh, little bit of video footage there. And um, we were looking at boar spears. Now, boar spears have a very different style of head to this. This, as you can see, is a long, relatively narrow, certainly compared to a boar spear head, and it does have a cross piece at the back. However, boar spears for the most part, dedicated boar spears that are actually just for hunting, um, tend to have much broader heads, shorter heads, uh, very thick, and the cross piece is right up behind the head. There isn't usually a length of socket or shaft behind the um, leaf part of the blade. There's normally, uh, the, so the, the cross piece is usually right behind the blades. And additionally, as well as the, the blades usually being more like a leaf shape, broader and shorter, um, the cross piece usually is long and straight and, and sometimes is articulated. Sometimes it's a, 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 an additional piece which is held on with a loop um, rather than these wings. These winged spears are something else entirely. Now, I have talked about these in a previous video. Just search winged spears in, in my videos. Um, and they actually turn up in the what we what a lot of people would call the Dark Ages. So um, let's say, in this case, we're talking about the 7th, 8th, 9th, um, 10th centuries. And um, they appear for reasons that we're not entirely clear about and so they're a very interesting weapon like all weapons where we don't fully understand them they're more interesting to talk about now back to the topic of this video it is very clear that these spears are cut and thrust spears if i was using it two-handed absolutely i could use it like a partisan or a glaive now what do i mean by that well i'm going to put the spear down for a second um, the spear is from Spears Plus, incidentally. I'm not paid to advertise them, but I like their, sh their shields. Their spear? I mean, the shield is from Shields Plus. Um, now, if I was using a weapon which could thrust and cut two-handed, then we know pretty much how they were used, or at least we know how they were used in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, because we've got treatises telling us. So if this was a partisan, for example, which is quite functionally similar to this weapon, um, then you can stab with it in all of the normal ways that you can stab with a spear, and um, you can give cuts as well. Now, cuts can be given potentially as a chop, they could be given as a push cut, Sometimes that's just simply because your thrust misses, or indeed they can be given as a draw cut, so pulling in towards you. So if I thrust at someone and they parry or I miss or they move or whatever, if my weapon's extended, I can now 
to the partially chop or partially draw cut back again while I reload for another thrust. One of the advantages with that, of course, is it enables me to, um, if my thrust misses or is deflected or parried, then I can potentially do cuts. There are some lines you can get to with a cut more easily than a thrust. Thrusts travel in straight lines, which a lot of people who don't understand fencing very much seem to say, seem to think is purely advantage. It's not. Something that moves only in a, st or predominantly in a straight line um, is actually easier to parry. Something, uh, something that can actually change direction and move move through the air. So a cut doesn't only have to move in a straight line. A cut could start here and actually finish down there. And that actually makes it harder to defend against. Cuts are generally speaking harder to defend than thrusts, in my opinion. Um, so being able to both cut and thrust gives you some advantages. Even if your partisan or winged spear, even if um, you only use it like 99% of the time to thrust, Still having that ability to cut is still useful in some situations. Um, now, another thing I would say about, about cut and thrust with this type of polearm is there are some issues, and I have, again, spoken about this in previous videos, there are some issues with cutting with some, anything which has a cylindrical shaft. And equally, just the way that the weight is distributed on a spear means that you get quite a lot of flex in the shaft if you move it laterally. It's very stiff moving it this way, but when you hit something, the, as you accelerate it, the shaft actually bends very slightly, obviously less so the heavier and stiffer you make the shaft, um, but bends backwards very slightly and when you impact something there's a lot more flex in the weapon so they can be powerful cutting weapons but they're not as powerful as a sword of the same length for example simply because there's flex in the weapon and what i would say linked to that point is another disadvantage is to make a uh, a pole arm into a cut and thrust weapon means you have to make it heavier pretty much always okay a thrusting spear can literally be a small steel spike at the end of a pole. So you can make it very, very light. That's why pikes, for example, can be 16, 18, 20 foot long um, because they've got relatively small heads at the end. Something that is as big as a winged spear or a partisan cannot be made particularly long because it just becomes too cumbersome. So for that reason, this is a relatively short one. Uh, this is what, about seven foot tall. Um, but for this reason, uh, things like partisans and glaives and uh, not so much halberds, but partisans and glaives and bills and things like this tend not to be um, over about eight foot maximum. Okay. After that, they just get too unwieldy and you'd never be able to cut with them at that length, um, you know, longer than that anyway. Um, so they have kind of optimum length. So just like with everything with weapons and in life, frankly, um, if it's not only a question of a question of adding things, plus ones, plus ones, plus ones. If you plus one here, you've got to minus one from somewhere else. And if you wanted to put it in role playing game stats, if we take a spear and add a plus one to its cutting ability, we minus one very often from its speed or its length or something else. Right, now, clearly forms of spear are not the only cutting polearm. There are also things which are obviously very dedicated towards cutting, like this poleaxe. Now, as I've mentioned before, this isn't a complete poleaxe. It's missing its top spike, it's missing its bottom spike. Not all of them have bottom spikes, but most do. Most do. Um, so it's actually, this is a bit more like a Dane axe with a, with a rear hammer on it. But nevertheless, it's a large two-handed axe. It is definitely qualifies as a polearm. Now, clearly as a two-handed weapon, this is quite a formidable thing. You can cut one way, you can come straight back the other way with the hammer or the, the hook or whatever it's got. You can change direction quite well with it. You can, uh, you can slip the hands on the weapon, which means you can instantly bring the back out um, to strike with the back quite effectively. But equally, you can go from having the head close to your hand to slipping it out and gaining reach as you swing but it also gives you a lot to parry with as well and stick in the way of other people's pole arms or whatever they're swinging at you. So it's a very versatile weapon in two hands but in one hand uh, not so much. <laughs> um, what can you really do with this in one hand? Well I personally can do very very little with this in one hand. Um, uh, I can move it um, I might be able to if I if I had it sort of charged up, I might even be able to throw one swing uh, with it at someone. But it's, it's so top heavy. I mean, look at the point of balance of this thing. It's, it's only about, what, 
18 inches from, well, let's say 30 centimeters, a bit more than 30. So it's more like 12 inches actually, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's about 30, 40 centimeters from the head and whoosh, like, <laughs> like one and a half and more than that I don't know like yeah one, let's say one meter from the from the tail so it balances very close to the head therefore the only way that I could really use this in one hand is to hold it where I might hold a one-handed axe but then you've got all of this shaft sticking out at the bottom haha <laughs> I said shaft um, and that kind of means it's completely impractical as a one-handed weapon so essentially if I was forced say I was fighting Polax and someone managed to chop my hand off or hit me in the arm such that I couldn't use this arm and I had no other weapons um, and for some reason I didn't want to run in and grapple or you know all that kind of stuff I would pretty much be limited to trying to use this weapon only to thrust because that's about the only effective thing I can do at this point one-handed with this weapon and it's the same thing if we go back Ah, let's put the pole axe out of the way. It's the same thing if we go back to the winged spear or partisan or glaive or whatever type of cut, type of cut and thrust pole arm you've got. It tends to, making it into an effective cutting weapon, tends to add so much mass at the head end of the weapon that not only does it mean that you have to make the shaft shorter and it makes the weapon slower, it also means you can't really use it in one hand for anything except for jabbing. Okay, so to come back to the original question, Matthew's question, or Matthew, um, I sound so, that my French accent is awful. Um, so if I had a winged spear, and now this is why I've thought about this, <laughs> I meant to mention this at the beginning. The reason why I've thought about this question many times is because if you look at um, Warhammer tabletop wargaming figures, or if you look at Lego men, or if you look at fantasy art, or indeed things like um, Lord of the Rings movies, or this type of thing. Sometimes you see someone who has got a, a, a classic example of this actually is um, you see some of the um, Urukai in uh, the Lord of the Rings films with this. You see someone who's got a shield in one hand, sometimes a really big shield, and in their right hand, and bear in mind, I'm including Lego men in this. I've seen Lego sets that have this. They've got a halberd, okay, um, or a bill, or you know, some other type of heavy cut and thrust pole arm. Now, this always makes me chuckle a bit because if you look at historical artwork, and this is a good challenge if you're someone who likes to trawl through manuscript images. Um, I'm not saying that you can't find an example, there might be an example in historical artwork, but you try and find me an example in historical art, I mean historical pre-19th century, so medieval or renaissance artwork, of someone who's got a halberd in one hand and a shield in the other. And the reason you don't see the two together is because you can't really use a halberd um, one-handed, except if you just use it as a really heavy and cumbersome spear. And if you're only going to use it for jabbing, okay, then why have an axe blade and a hook on it? Why have all that extra mass? Um, it makes no sense at all. So quite simply, going back to my original point, can you use a heavy cut and thrust pole arm uh, with a shield? Kind of no. Um, but as I've said, I would caveat that, that if you're absolutely forced to, for some reason, um, then you could indeed just jab with your bill or halberd or whatever. And there are some pole arms that are more manageable in one hand for thrusting than others. For example, um, at what I'm holding here, a winged spear. You can use a winged spear simply as a fairly heavy and cumbersome one-handed spear. And in fact, we do see this in period artwork. Um, we do see what seem to be winged spears used in one hand and a shield in the other in Carolingian and um, uh, kind of 10th, 11th century art as well. Um, occasionally but of course we don't know about the weight of those wing spears we, they might be quite light wing spears they might have only very you know limited cutting capacity um, we do not really I've never ever seen anything like a bill uh, used in one hand with a with a shield something like a partisan well a partisan really is basically what this is in terms of weight and stats this is to all intents and purposes like a partisan could you use a partisan with a shield or, you know, in that period, more like a rotella, I would say. Yes, you could, um, but again, it's going to be like a heavy spear, um, unless it's a particularly light partisan. And it has to be said, some pole weapons can be made to cut and still be light. But it has to be light. If you're going to use the weapon in one hand, uh, nimbly with a shield, 
you're only really going to be able to thrust with it. You can't cut one-handed with a weapon of this length. You wouldn't be able to get the edge aligned and it's just going to be hopeless. Um, except maybe a push cut, maybe a draw cut at a pinch, but generally speaking, only thrust. Um, so, um, so absolutely, I would say to, to, to wrap this up and to, to conclude, I would say that you might find um, limited examples of certain types of cut and thrust polearm used with a shield, but it's extremely rare and it depends very much on the type of polearm. You might find something like a partisan, which is relatively speaking light, but to find something like a halberd or a bill um, or even a glaive used one-handed with a shield, no, not really. There is one final, I know some of you might think maybe in kind of um, role-playing game terms or computer gaming terms, uh, there is one scenario or context where possibly, possibly, if you own a shield and own a halberd, there might be a reason to have both at the same time. And that might be if you're advancing into missile fire. And absolutely, I would say, if you're a halberdier or a billman, and your primary purpose is to use a halberd or a bill two-handed, then if you do have a shield and you're allowed to use it and you have to walk towards crossbowmen or bowmen or uh, castle walls, for example, in a siege, possibly, possibly, in that scenario, you might advance with your bill, essentially, or halberd, just carrying it at the drag, as they would say, with the, with the tail dragging behind, cowering behind your shield until you're close enough to get into combat, at which point you might then drop your, uh, drop your um, shield because you're now into close combat and less likely to be shot at and use your weapon two-handed. So that is one final extra caveat I would add to my general story. But generally speaking, can you cut with a polearm one-handed while using a shield? Generally speaking, no. Um, might you use a cut and thrust polearm with a shield in combat? Not usually, no, but there might be some bizarre exception to that and a particularly light, a light partisan or something like that. Maybe, possibly it'd be like a heavy spear. And lastly, would you ever use a shield if you had a halberd or a bill? The only scenario I can think of is where I just described if you were advancing into arrows that were being shot at you and then dropping the shield at the last minute to come in with your weapon two-handed. I hope that was moderately interesting and see you again for the next video. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.